Thank you very much, um, Lord Justice Arnold. Um, and thank you all uh, for coming today. We hope you're going to have a, a, a really marvellous day. Uh, as my biography will set out for you, uh, I'm uh, Cathy Liddell. My special interest is intellectual property, uh, particularly patents, and particularly life sciences. So I've been a member of CIPL, the Centre for Intellectual Property and Information Law here in Cambridge for many years, and more recently uh, the director of a Centre for Law, Medicine and Life Sciences that we have here too. So for this opening presentation, uh, I'd like to share with you our conceptual framing, which is really just a little uh, bit of um, fancy language for how the day's been organised. Uh, and I'd like to, at, at this point, without um, even going a moment further, just uh, give a, a brief shout out to two of the people, um, aside from Lionel, of course, who have been very instrumental in bringing this day together. And that's uh, John Lidicote, uh, who's sitting over here. You'll see him throughout the day. And also Matt Jordan, who's um, up, up, up the back there. So uh, I shall be um, describing um, uh, how and why we've organised the day the way we have, uh, but I'm really the spokesperson um, for other minds. All right, so um, first a little about our objectives and motivation. So each year for uh, quite a few years now, uh, SIPL holds a spring conference uh, with the explicit aim of bringing together intellectual property practitioners uh, with intellectual property academics. And the principal idea is to share information about uh, statutory and case law developments in IP law, plus um, add some recent academic research which practitioners might not ordinarily have the time uh, to keep up with. And we hope that a foray into the academic world will showcase uh, how um, we explore and um, perhaps have some role in uh, helping to shape the field. So the, the topic of this year, um, IP and health, uh, reflects a key uh, research interest within SIPL and uh, LML, the Centre for Law, Medicine and Life Sciences. We are uh, fortunate to be part of an international research collaboration that's been funded for five years by the Novo Nordisk Foundation. Uh, the focus of the collaboration is uh, incentives for pharmaceutical innovation uh, and whether um, uh, various legally based incentives are working well or well enough. So amongst this are projects um, uh, on uh, five topics uh, and a synergy cross-cutting project, topics such as precision medicine, antimicrobial and repurposed drugs. Uh, and our collaborators include uh, the University of Copenhagen, uh, Harvard Medical School, Harvard Law School and uh, the University of Michigan. So uh, that, is, um, that has been a really marvellous collaboration uh, and uh, we're getting a lot out of it and we hope contributing quite a lot too. We're also very fortunate uh, currently to have another international collaborator and that's uh, Professor Rochelle Dreyfus from NYU in the US and she's here with our law faculty for 12 months <coughs> as the visiting Goodhart professor. Uh, that's a very esteemed position, uh, the most esteemed visiting position in our law faculty and it even comes complete with a traditional British characterful accommodation, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm sure Rochelle can tell you about. <laughs> yeah. It's said it's traditional. <laughs> right, so uh, now I'd like to uh, explain the topic in a little more detail. It's actually relatively simple. Um, intellectual property rights, uh, I should have apologize for some of you who are really expert in this field this will be just you know very basic recap but you know to set the scene and in view of the broad audience we have today I just want to go over you know intellectual property rights are exceptional rights in a competitive market 
A variety of justifications have been offered and an equal number criticised. Uh, but in the main, people accept some sort of cost-benefit reasoning. The idea being that exceptional exclusivity is warranted because it works as an incentive for socially beneficial innovation, investment and dissemination, which would not otherwise happen, or at least not to the same extent. Now, when it comes to social benefit, incentives to improve people's health is clearly a worthy goal. Health is really important. Without it, you don't have much and can't do much. You feel ill. You can't work, go to school. You struggle to utilise other social and civil rights. It's the foundation of so much and it warrants protection. And looking at current events as the world uh, sits on the brink of a viral pandemic, it's taken hold in less than four months. Health can't be taken for granted in any country. And if intellectual property rights help incentivise activities that improve health, that's a good thing. And even strident critics of intellectual property rights, such as James Besson and Michael Muir, take the view based on graphs like this that IPRs in the pharma industry have benefits that outweigh their costs, even uh, if, if they don't function in that way in other industries. However, we shouldn't be complacent. Like health, our IP system shouldn't be taken for granted. And like viruses, our IP system also evolves with time. It could take on many different forms. Legal historians, comparative legal scholars, and practitioners working for multinational companies, you know this, you're highly aware of this. And coupled with the hope that policy influencers, teachers and legal advocates might be able to steer the development of intellectual property law, it's worth checking its pulse, seeing if there's a case for a different diagnosis or a different patient management plan. And just like good medical practice, the IP system's health check needs to be holistic, multidisciplinary and evidence-based. And this event is about that. Our overarching objective is to share information and views about whether IP is evolving in the right direction and a direction that is good for our health. Okay, so now a word or two about the structure of the day. In the morning, uh, we're going to have uh, legal updates from leading practitioners. And each speaker's been asked to present for um, around 20 minutes, leaving 10 minutes for questions. And uh, we'd like the audience to keep thoughts and comments in mind, though, as we'll have a, a longer uh, discussion session at the end of the day. In the afternoon, uh, we'll hear from three leading researchers and they will share their views on whether more detailed research lends credence to the view that IP law is good for our health. The researchers' talks uh, have been organised to focus primarily on patent law and primarily on empirical uh, data research. And this was because uh, patent law and empirical data-driven research uh, reflects a strength within our faculty's IP research, uh, I, I hope it doesn't sound too um, uh, <coughs> self-congratulatory, but um, we are becoming known as one of the strongest centres for uh, empirical patent law research, uh, and that now complements the, the, the accolades um, that the centre's had for a long time for historical and international IP research uh, led by uh, Lionel and, and Henning. We had hoped that Ellen Tone... Um, would be part of the lineup in the afternoon, but um, unfortunately she's had a bereavement uh, and so cannot be with us. Um, I'm very sorry about this actually because I, I know she would have added a very important developing country uh, perspective uh, to our program. Uh, now then, just to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to wrap up over the remaining time, I'd like to um, forecast some of the questions that uh, we hope to think about today. Because although the idea behind the conference is simple, uh, answers 
to the questions raised by the topic are not. So the title of the conference is uh, Deliberately Challenging, uh, Deliberately Provocative. Is IP good for our health? What does the word good mean? Well, uh, there's a question <laughs> that uh, has been troubling philosophers and people for centuries. How do we define good? Is it the greatest good for the greatest many? Or sufficient good for all? Or, as political systems tend to approach it, uh, good for some within our country's borders? Then, having defined it, um, how might we go about measuring it or recognising it? There are two types of criticisms levelled at IP rights and their impact on health, particularly patent rights. The first criticism is that patents underpin excessive prices which overcompensate the pharma industry for its investment and risk-taking, making it year on year uh, one of the wealthiest industries. So a question this raises is whether there's a way to adjust IPRs so that the pharma industry is more averagely profitable and medicines are less expensive and thus more accessible. Relatedly, can we achieve more granularity about the areas of pharma R&D and the firms uh, which are generating excess profits and those that are struggling? Uh, profit profitability is, is not uniform. A second criticism is that patents steer health research towards improvements that are valued by wealthy people. Not necessarily the improvements that would bring the most relief from suffering, for example, improvements uh, for the global poor. A question this raises is whether it is inevitable uh, that patents uh, work in this manner, given the connection between patent rights and market exclusivity. Is the problem actually capital, capitalist markets? Another uh, equally challenging issue is what do we mean with the words our health? Who is the our? Is it people in the UK? Even that is a very heterogeneous group with multiple ages, ethnicities and a variety of um, socio-economic backgrounds. And what about the wider world? Are we talking about the health of people around the world? The health problems facing the global poor are huge and very different from the leading causes of mortality and morbidity in the Western world. And what do we mean by health? Are we talking about health improvement from pharmaceutical pills? What about prevention, diagnosis and medical devices? One could even extend this to environmental health, taking account of the idea that the health of environments, microorganisms, animals, and humans are all intertwined. We could also consider what we even mean by the concept of intellectual property. Clearly patents, trademarks and copyright. But what about trade secrets? Intellectual property? And what about regulatory exclusivities, which don't actually often feature in intellectual property law textbooks? What about neighbouring issues such as fair competition? Another set of issues uh, flow from the complexity of the IP system. IP could be likened to the human body, which although one unit comprises many systems, including, for instance, circulatory, nervous, musculoskeletal, respiratory and digestive systems. There are multiple IP rights, like human systems, and thus issues about overlap and interaction. And then within each right, such as patent law, there are questions about the architecture and policy levers, which we might adjust to better calibrate the system. For example, if we find a policy issue, should we adjust inventive step for all inventions if the effects are mainly felt in the pharma industry? Or should we try to tailor matters through subject matter eligibility or tailored defences? 
Now, the relationship between IP rights and market transactions is also an important area to consider. Ultimately, IP rights provide a bargaining position. They don't actually set prices or income. When we get a shock from high sticker prices for drugs, we might be tempted to lay the blame on the patent system, but it's also, also important uh, to consider how prices are arrived at. Most countries have systems for price negotiations. Patent protection and regulatory exclusivities get people to the table, but high prices are partly the result of flaws in the subsequent negotiations. For example, limited disclosure about R&D expenditure, uh, limited uh, knowledge about prices agreed in other jurisdictions, and limited knowledge about the length of exclusivity uh, that the patent owner might actually have before an alternative product uh, comes to market. It's also important to remember that uh, sticker prices are not necessarily the actual price being paid. Price cutting deals are done uh, with um, major uh, pharmaceutical buyers uh, and individual hospitals. And in some countries, like the UK, some pharmaceutical companies enter into arrangements whereby they actually uh, pay back money if their profits exceed a certain pre-agreed level. So deciding which technique or approach we're going to use to address policy problems and calibrate the IP system is you know, another big area of complexity. Another set of issues are born uh, from legal certainty, or more precisely, a lack of legal um, certainty. It's quite difficult to track and evaluate uh, recent developments if it's not entirely clear uh, from where we are travelling and to what destination. A final question I'd like to pose is this. If we can't reach clear answers on whether IP is good for our health, is it worth asking the question at all? Is it as useful as Plato's proverbial blind man in a cave discussing what the world outside the cave looks like and how he might improve it? Or is the search for issues and possible responses and better data a bit like health surveillance and systems-focused public health interventions, admittedly limited but plausibly beneficial. Okay, so these are some of the questions for today. Um, we may not get to all of them. Uh, some will be discussed expressly and some will be implicit undercurrents. Uh, but uh, I'd like to encourage you to, to think about them and uh, to feel free to raise them uh, in discussions throughout the day. Thank you and um, have a great day.